Story 1. I moved into the old house on the outskirts of town at the beginning of autumn. The real estate agent had been eager to sell, mentioning a few times too many how lucky I was to find such a charming place at a bargain. The house was indeed charming, with its Victorian architecture and an overgrown garden that whispered tales of yesteryears. What she failed to mention, however, was the house's peculiarities that soon became apparent. It started with the noises. Taps and creaks are expected in any old house, I told myself, but these were different. They were rhythmic, almost like footsteps pacing back and forth inside the walls. I brushed it off as the house settled, despite the unease that settled in me. Then, objects began to move. Books I had placed on the coffee table would find their way back to the shelf, and not just any shelf but the top one, far out of my reach. A painting I had hung in the hallway would always tilt to the left, no matter how many times I straightened it. My keys, which I habitually left in the bowl by the front door, would vanish, only to reappear in the most unlikely places, like the empty bathtub or atop the kitchen cabinets. I tried to rationalize these occurrences, attributing them to forgetfulness or perhaps a draft that somehow managed to lift and carry my keys across the house, but deep down I felt it, the unnerving sensation of being watched. I would often spin around expecting to catch a glimpse of someone or something, but I was always met with emptiness. One afternoon, driven by a mix of curiosity and frustration, I decided to thoroughly explore the house. I had been through every room, or so I thought. In the basement, behind a stack of old, dust-covered boxes, I found a door. It was small, almost like it was meant for a child, and well hidden. The real estate agent hadn't mentioned this room, and it wasn't in the house's blueprints, which I had meticulously studied when I moved in. With a sense of trepidation, I opened the door. It led to a narrow passage that twisted and turned before opening into a small, hidden room. The air was stale and a thin layer of dust covered the floor, undisturbed. But it was what was in the room that took my breath away. A small cot, a wooden chair, and a table that held various objects, a few cans of food, a stack of books, and most disturbingly, a collection of photographs. The photos were of me. Some were taken from a distance, others up close while I slept or ate. There was a meticulousness to the collection, a disturbing attention to detail. My heart raced as I realized that someone had been living here, in the walls of my own home, watching me, studying me. I stumbled back, my mind racing with questions. Who was this person? How long had they been here? And where were they now? The realization that they might still be in the house, watching me discover their sanctuary, sent a chill down my spine. I left the room, sealing the door behind me, and rushed upstairs to call the police. They arrived quickly, searching the house in the hidden room, but found no one. The officer in charge suggested that the person might have realized I was getting too close to discovering their hiding spot and fled. In the days that followed, the noises ceased, and my belongings stayed where I left them. The feeling of being watched dissipated, replaced by a haunting loneliness and a myriad of unanswered questions. Who had been my unseen tenant? What did they want from me? The house felt emptier, its secrets laid bare yet still unfathomable. I couldn't shake the feeling that the eyes that had watched me from the shadows might still be out there, observing from a distance. The thought haunted my nights, turning every shadow into a potential watcher. The house, once a charming Victorian dream, had become a nightmare. Yet, I couldn't bring myself to leave. I needed answers. So I began my own investigation into the house's history, digging through old records and newspaper archives. What I found was a story of tragedy and secrecy, a family torn apart by loss, and a son who disappeared without a trace, rumored to have run away but never found. Could he have returned to the only home he knew, living unseen within its walls? The thought was both terrifying and sad, a ghost of the past clinging to the remnants of a life long gone. I've decided to stay, for now, to uncover the truth of the unseen tenant.
The house, with all its peculiarities and mysteries, has become a part of me. Or perhaps I have become a part of its history, another chapter in its long and storied past. As I write this, the sun sets, casting long shadows across the room. And for a moment, just a fleeting moment, I feel the familiar prickle of being watched. But when I turn, there's nothing there. Just the silence of an old house, and the whisper of stories yet to be told. Continuing from where we left off, the house and I settled into an uneasy truce. The days turned into weeks, and the weeks into months, with no sign of my unseen watcher. Yet, the presence I felt lingered, a silent companion in the vast, echoing rooms of the house. Determined to unearth the truth, I delved deeper into the history of the house and its previous occupants. My search led me to an elderly woman in town, the last living relative of the family that once called my house home. She agreed to speak with me, her eyes reflecting a mix of sorrow and fear as she recounted the tale of her nephew, a troubled soul who vanished without a trace. Her belief was that he had come back, that the house had called him home. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the hidden room, intent on finding any clue that might have been overlooked. As I sifted through the belongings left behind, I discovered a journal buried beneath the cot's threadbare mattress. Its pages were filled with the ramblings of a mind teetering on the edge of sanity, speaking of voices that whispered through the walls and visions of a family that had long since abandoned him. It was a heart-wrenching read, the words of someone desperately seeking connection in a world that had forgotten him. I couldn't help but feel a profound sadness for the unseen tenant, whose life had been reduced to shadows and secrecy. The journal ended abruptly, with a final entry that spoke of a plan to leave, to seek out a new beginning away from the confines of the house. Whether he found the peace he was searching for remains a mystery. With no further leads to follow, the investigation stalled. The house, once filled with the echoes of its hidden occupant, grew silent. I began to renovate, hoping to breathe new life into the old walls and perhaps to make peace with the spirits that lingered. The hidden room was transformed into a library, a place of light and learning where the darkness of the past could find no foothold. I filled it with books and comfortable chairs, a haven for the troubled souls that might find their way there seeking solace among the stories of others. As time passed, the feeling of being watched faded, replaced by a sense of calm. I like to think that the unseen tenant found his way out of the darkness, that in sharing his story, I helped to free him from the chains of the past. The house on the outskirts of town, with its Victorian charm and secret rooms, became a home. Not just for me, but for the memories and stories of those who had passed through its doors. It stood as a testament to the unseen and unheard. A reminder that everyone has a story worth telling, even if it's from the shadows. In the end, the true horror wasn't the unseen tenant or the mysterious happenings within the house. It was the realization of how easily a life could be forgotten, lost between the cracks of history and memory. My journey had begun with fear, but it ended with understanding and a deep, abiding compassion for the unseen and unremembered. And sometimes, late at night, when the wind howls through the eaves and the house creaks with the weight of years, I can almost hear a whisper, a thank you from the shadows, and I smile, knowing the unseen tenant is at peace. Story 2 I had always found something soothing about flying at night. The quiet hum of the engines, the soft glow of the cabin lights dimmed to mimic the stars outside and the world passing by unseen below. It was on such a night that I boarded Flight 237, bound for a city halfway across the world, unaware that this journey would be unlike any other. The flight was oddly empty, a rarity I attributed to the late hour and the less popular route. Settling into my seat, I welcomed the extra space, stretching out as the plane taxied down the runway. As we ascended, the familiar sense of detachment from the ground below took hold, and I drifted into a fitful sleep, lulled by the monotonous drone of the aircraft. I awoke to a sense of unease, 
the kind that sits heavy in the pit of your stomach, turning and twisting. The cabin was shrouded in darkness, the only light coming from the occasional blink of the seatbelt sign. It was then I noticed the silence, not the absence of sound, but the lack of presence. The whispers of conversation, the rustle of blankets, the soft footsteps of the cabin crew all were missing. Rising from my seat, I moved down the aisle, my footsteps muted against the carpet. The seats were occupied, but not by living passengers. Each one held a specter, a ghostly figure staring straight ahead, their expressions etched with a mix of confusion, fear, and resignation. I stopped, my heart racing. As the realization hit me, I was the only living soul aboard. Panic threatened to take hold, but a voice, soft and ethereal, spoke, breaking the silence. Please, don't be afraid, it said, coming from a woman seated nearby. Her form was translucent, shimmering in the dim light. We mean you no harm. We are trapped, reliving our last moments, unable to move on. As I listened, each spirit began to share their tale, stories of lives cut short by tragedy, accidents, and fate's cruel hand. They spoke of their regrets, their unfinished business, and their desire for peace. The aircraft became a vessel of voices, a chorus of the departed seeking solace in being heard. Among them, a young man caught my attention. His story was different. He spoke of a message, one that he had been trying to send to the living before his untimely death. It was a warning, a plea to prevent a disaster that he had foreseen but had been powerless to stop. As the spirits shared their stories, the flight continued the world outside oblivious to the extraordinary gathering within. I listened, offering comfort where I could, a bridge between the living and the dead. The plane began its descent, the first light of dawn breaking the horizon. The spirits grew restless, their time running short. The young man with the message approached me, urgency in his ethereal voice. Please, he implored, you must warn them. The disaster I foresaw, it's not over. It will happen again, unless you stop it. The plane touched down, the spell of the night broken as the cabin filled with the sound of engines winding down and the click of seatbelts being released. I turned to look at the seats, now empty, the spirits gone, their presence a lingering memory in the air. I stepped off the plane, the weight of the message heavy on my shoulders. The spirits had chosen me, but why? And what was the disaster I needed to prevent? With only the clues provided by the young man's warning, I set out to uncover the truth, knowing that the lives of countless others might depend on it. With a heart burdened by the weight of the unseen and the yet to be understood, I ventured forth from the airport, the dawn's early light casting long shadows across my path. The message was cryptic, the details sparse, but the urgency in the young man's spectral plea was unmistakable. Something disastrous loomed on the horizon, a calamity that had claimed their lives and threatened to do so again. My first step was to research Flight 237's history, diving into news archives and aviation records. The deeper I delved, the clearer the picture became. Flight 237 was not just any flight, it had been the final journey for those souls a flight that had ended in tragedy years ago under mysterious circumstances. The official reports mentioned a sudden catastrophic failure, but whispers of a possible cover-up, of ignored warnings, surfaced in the margins of the investigation. The young man's message took on a new significance. He had been a whistleblower, a voice of reason drowned out by bureaucracy and disbelief. His warning unheeded had cost him and the others their lives. And now, history threatened to repeat itself with another flight, Flight 237's spiritual successor, scheduled to take the same route. Be armed with this knowledge, I sought out experts, aviation authorities, and anyone who would listen. Skepticism met me at every turn, my warnings dismissed as the ramblings of someone who had flown too close to the sun of grief and imagination. But I couldn't, wouldn't. It wouldn't give up. 
The lives of those aboard the upcoming flight hung in the balance, and the spirits of the past demanded justice and prevention. As the date of the flight approached, my desperation grew. It was then that an unexpected ally emerged, a journalist who had followed the original Flight 237 story with a suspicion that matched my own. Together, we pieced together the evidence, connecting dots that painted a damning picture of negligence and a flaw that had never been fully addressed. Our efforts culminated in a press conference, mere hours before the scheduled departure of the new Flight 237. Armed with facts and the unignorable voices of those lost, we presented our case to the world. The reaction was immediate and overwhelming. The flight was delayed, then canceled, as authorities scrambled to re-examine the evidence we had laid bare. In the aftermath, an investigation was launched, leading to the grounding of the aircraft model in question until the flaw was rectified. The spirits of Flight 237 had been heard, their message delivered through me, a living conduit to the world they had left behind. As the dust settled, I found myself standing once again in the quiet of the night, looking up at the stars. The weight of the message had lifted, replaced by a sense of peace. The spirits, their last moments relived in the hopes of changing the future, had found their rest. And in doing so, they had changed me, imbuing me with a purpose that went beyond the boundaries of life and death. I realized then that our lives are intertwined with those who have passed, their stories woven into the fabric of our being. And sometimes it takes a journey into the unknown, a flight into the darkness, to understand the true nature of our existence and the power of a message carried on the wings of the departed. Story 3 The village of Eldwin had always been steeped in mystery, Nestled in a valley surrounded by ancient woods with tales as old as the stones that lined its narrow paths. Central to its lore was the well, an ancient structure said to be as old as the village itself, located in the square. It had not seen water for generations, its depths a whispered promise of secrets long forgotten. For as long as anyone could remember, the well had been a benign relic of the past a place for children to dare each other to look into its shadowed depths or for elders to reminisce about the days when it still gave water. But as the autumn nights grew longer and the shadows deeper, the well began to whisper. At first it was dismissed as the wind, a natural occurrence in the old and winding streets of Eldwin. But soon, those whispers took on form names, softly spoken in the dead of night. The villagers would wake to find that whoever's name was called had vanished, leaving no trace behind, as if swallowed by the earth itself. Fear took hold of Eldwin, the whispers from the well becoming a nightly terror. No one knew when their name might be spoken, who or what chose the names or why. The well, once a forgotten relic, was now a specter that haunted every conversation, every silent moment. Then, one night, as a chill wind danced through the village and the moon hung low and full, casting silver light across the cobblestones, my name was whispered. Lying awake in the darkness, the soft call seemed like a death knell, a sentence passed without trial. The sound was clear, unmistakable, and it came from the well. Panic gripped me, a cold hand around my heart. To be named was to disappear, to become a ghost story for the next generation. But as the initial terror subsided, a defiant resolve took its place. I would not vanish into the night, another unsolved mystery of Eldwin. I needed to understand, to confront whatever force had marked me. Armed with nothing but a lantern and a desperate need for answers, I made my way to the square. The village was silent, save for the sound of my own footsteps echoing against the stone. The well stood before me darker than the night that enveloped us both, an abyss waiting to consume its next victim. Drawing a deep breath, I approached, my light casting long shadows into its depths. I expected fear, terror, but what I found instead was a pull, a calling that resonated deep within my bones. 
The well was not just a well, it was a gateway, a keeper of secrets that stretched back into the mists of time. As I stood there, peering into the darkness, the whispers grew louder, more insistent. They spoke of ancient packs and forgotten histories, of a time when Eldwin was not just a village but a crossroads for worlds seen and unseen. And they spoke of a choice, a chance to break the cycle that had claimed so many. The air around me grew colder, the night pressing in, as if waiting for my decision. To step away would mean safety, a return to the uncertainty of being one among many, waiting for the night my name would be called again. To step forward, into the embrace of the unknown held the promise of answers and perhaps a way to save those who had been lost. With the weight of the village's fate teetering on the edge of my decision, I chose to step forward. The whispers turned into a symphony of voices, a cacophony that seemed to echo from the very depths of the earth. My heart raced as I peered into the abyss, the darkness of the well seemingly alive, pulsating with unseen energy. As my hand touched the ancient stone, a surge of visions flashed before my eyes images of Eldwin through the ages, of ceremonies and sacrifices made in the name of forgotten gods, of a pact made to protect the village at a terrible cost. The well, I realized, was not merely a source of water but a sacred site, a binding contract between the villagers and the unseen forces that lay just beyond the veil of our world. The disappearances, the names whispered in the night they were not random but a tithe a demand for payment on a debt centuries overdue. The well had grown hungry, its patience thinning with each passing generation's ignorance of the old ways. Armed with this knowledge, I understood what needed to be done. The pact needed to be renewed, but not at the cost of more lives. I spoke, my voice steady, offering myself as the bridge between the villagers and the ancient beings to whom they had once pledged themselves. I proposed a new deal, one that would protect Eldwin without the need for sacrifice. The air stilled, the whispers ceasing as if the forces beyond were considering my offer. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, a feeling of peace settled over the square. The well's dark presence receded, replaced by a sense of benign watchfulness. I knew then that the offer had been accepted, the cycle broken. In the days that followed, the village slowly returned to life, the shadow of the well's threat lifted. The disappearances stopped, and although no one spoke of it openly, there was a palpable sense of relief, a collective exhale as Eldwin stepped back from the brink of an unseen abyss. I, however, had changed. The well had accepted my offer, binding me to it and the village in a way I could never have imagined. I became the guardian of the pact, the mediator between the worlds. It was a role I accepted with humility, aware of the responsibility that rested on my shoulders. As years passed, I taught the villagers of the old ways, of the importance of remembering and honoring the past. The well, once a source of fear, became a sacred place once more, a reminder of the delicate balance between our world and the ones that whisper just beyond our understanding. The story of Whispers from the Well concludes with Eldwin thriving, a village steeped in mystery but grounded in a new understanding of its place in the world. The Well no longer whispers names in the night but is respected as a symbol of the pact that protects the village, a bridge between the seen and unseen. Story 4 The day I brought the antique mirror home from the local thrift shop marked the beginning of an eerie chapter in my life one that would challenge my understanding of reality. It was a beautiful piece, its frame carved with intricate designs that spoke of a bygone era, and it seemed to draw me in from the moment I saw it. Little did I know it would soon draw much more than just my admiration. For the first few days, it hung on my bedroom wall as a silent observer, its presence adding a touch of elegance to the room. However, it wasn't long before I began to notice something unsettling. My reflection seemed off. At first, it was subtle, a flicker of movement that didn't match my own, 
a delay in mirroring my actions as if the image was struggling to keep up. I brushed it off as a trick of the light or a figment of my imagination, but the anomalies grew more pronounced, more difficult to ignore. My reflection began mimicking my movements with a noticeable delay, moving independently of my actions, its expressions a mimicry of my own yet tinged with something I couldn't quite place. Then it started showing me doing things I hadn't done, actions I hadn't taken. At first these were mundane reaching for a book one hadn't picked up, turning to look at something that wasn't there. But as the days passed, the actions grew more disturbing. I watched horrified, as my reflection screamed without sound, its face contorted in terror, or stood motionless, staring back at me with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. Fear took hold, a pervasive dread that filled my waking hours and haunted my dreams. The mirror had become a portal to a world that mirrored my own yet was twisted by some malevolent force. I researched the mirror's origins, hoping to find an explanation or a way to break its hold over me. The trail led me to the estate of a family long since fallen from grace, whose history was marked by tragedy and rumors of a curse. The more I learned, the more I realized that the mirror was not just reflecting a different reality, it was showing me possibilities, futures that could come to pass if I continued down the path I was on. It was a warning, a guide of sorts, but one that came with a price. I knew then that I had to make a choice. I could rid myself of the mirror, and with it, the haunting visions of what might be, or I could face what it was trying to show me, delve into the mysteries it held and confront the darkness at its heart. Choosing the latter was a decision born out of desperation and a need to understand. I began to watch the mirror closely, trying to decipher the meaning behind the actions it showed me, looking for clues in the nightmare visions it projected. As my resolve solidified, the mirror's reflections grew increasingly vivid and urgent, as though responding to my determination. It no longer just mimicked or warned it began to communicate, revealing glimpses of events yet to unfold, both horrifying and enlightening. These visions, though cryptic, hinted at a deeper connection between the mirror and the lineage of its previous owners, suggesting that its purpose was not merely to haunt but to protect a guardian across time, bound to aid those who could unravel its mysteries. Embracing this newfound understanding, I embarked on a journey that led me through the annals of history, tracing the mirror's origins back to a time when superstition and the supernatural were intertwined with the fabric of daily life. I discovered that the mirror had been crafted by a cabal of seers as a tool, not just for divination but as a safeguard against a specific malevolence that threatened their lineage. With each revelation, the mirror's behavior intensified, its visions becoming clearer, more focused. It showed me places I needed to visit, books I needed to read, and people I needed to speak to. Each step forward unraveled a thread of the past weaving it into the tapestry of the present, revealing a pattern of destiny that had led me to the mirror. The climax of this journey was a confrontation not with a specter or a demon, but with my own fear and skepticism. In a ritual as old as the mirror itself, I stood before it at the stroke of midnight, the time when the veil between worlds is thinnest, and spoke aloud the incantation I had pieced together from the clues it had given me. As the final word left my lips, the mirror's surface rippled like the surface of a disturbed pond, and then cleared. The reflection that stared back was my own, but changed. No longer did it move with a delay or show me scenes of horror. Instead, it revealed a path forward, a road leading out of darkness into light. The curse, if it was, had been broken, or perhaps fulfilled. The mirror now silent, was just a mirror once more. But the journey it had prompted had changed me, had shown me that the line between the natural and the supernatural is not as defined as we believe, and that sometimes the greatest mysteries lie not in the shadows, but within ourselves. 
The mirror hangs in my room still, a reminder of the adventure it took me on and the lessons it taught me. No longer do I fear its reflections, for I know now that it was never the mirror itself that held power, but the belief in actions of those who stood before it. Story 5 It was a dare, a foolish one, that led us to the decrepit gates of the Ashcliff Asylum. The air was thick with the scent of mold and decay, a tangible reminder of the stories that lingered about this place. They said it was haunted, cursed by the souls of patients long forgotten, but we, fueled by youth and the thrill of the unknown, paid no heed to such tales. The asylum loomed before us, its broken windows like empty eye sockets watching, waiting. The front door, surprisingly, gave way with a gentle push, a silent invitation into its shadowed halls. We ventured in, our flashlights cutting through the darkness, revealing peeling paint and graffiti-covered walls. It felt as if the very air was saturated with despair, the echoes of pain and madness clinging to every surface. We found the patient records room, an eerie archive of lost minds. Dust-covered files littered the floor, their contents a testament to the horrors that transpired within these walls. Names and faces blurred together, but one file caught my attention patient 237, Elizabeth Morrow. The photo showed a young woman, her eyes hauntingly empty. According to the file, she vanished from her room, her body never found. Drawn by a compulsion I couldn't explain, I led my friends deeper into the asylum. The air grew colder, the oppressive silence broken only by our footsteps and the occasional drip of water. It was in the bowels of the asylum, in a long-forgotten ward, that we found them. Patients, or what remained of them, trapped not by physical restraints but by time itself. They roamed the halls, their forms flickering like old film, caught between worlds. Their eyes met ours, and in their gaze I saw eternity endless suffering, endless madness. One approached, her form stabilizing as she drew closer. It was Elizabeth, her eyes now filled with a terrifying awareness. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered, her voice a chilling caress. This place it consumes. It took us and now it wants you. Panic set in, a primal urge to flee. But the corridors twisted and turned, leading us in circles. The boundary between the living and the dead blurred as more patients emerged, their whispers filling our ears, sharing tales of their endless torment. We were lost, hope fading, when I remembered the file. Elizabeth's file. On a whim, guided by desperation, I held it out to her. Her eyes widened, and for a moment, the madness receded. The window in my room, she said. It's the way out. That is the way out. Racing back to the records room, we found the map of the asylum. Elizabeth's room was in a secluded wing, one we hadn't explored. With no time to lose, we followed her directions, finding the room with surprising ease. The window was there, just as she said, but it was no ordinary escape. Beyond it lay not the asylum grounds, but another place, another time. We climbed through, one by one, emerging into the light of day, the asylum a distant memory. As we looked back, the building shimmered and faded, as if releasing us from its grip. We never spoke of what happened, each of us carrying the weight of that night in silence. But sometimes, in the quiet moments before sleep claims me, I hear their whispers, the patients of Ashcliff Asylum, reminding me of the thin veil between sanity and madness, and of the night we walked their halls. Continuing from where we left off, our escape from the asylum was not the end of our story, it was merely the beginning of a deeper nightmare. The world we returned to seemed off, as if by passing through that window we had stepped into a reality slightly askew from our own. In the days that followed, each of us experienced strange occurrences. Shadows lingered longer than they should, and whispers filled the air, echoes of the asylum's madness infiltrating our lives. It became clear that whatever resided in Ashcliff had not let us go completely. One night, compelled by an unknown force, I returned to the site of the asylum. 
The building was gone, replaced by an empty field, but the air still held a charge, as if the land remembered the horrors it once cradled. As I stood there, the ground beneath me began to tremble, and a fissure opened, revealing a stairway leading down into darkness, without knowing why I descended. The stairs ended in a cavernous room, lit by an otherworldly glow. In its center stood a stone altar, and on it, the files of every patient Ashcliffe had ever held, including Elizabeth's. As I approached, the air thickened and the whispers grew louder, coalescing into a single voice. You freed them, it said, a voice both ancient and anguished, but freedom comes with a price. The room began to spin, and I found myself reliving the asylum's darkest moments through the eyes of its patients. I felt their despair, their longing for release, and understood that Ashcliff was not just a place, but a prison for souls too tormented to find peace. When the vision ceased, I was back in the field, the fissure gone as if it had never been. But the weight of what I had experienced remained, a burden I now carried. I realized then that our intrusion into the asylum had broken a seal, releasing not just the spirits of its patients, but something older, something that had been contained within its walls. In the weeks that followed, my friends and I worked to find a way to right what we had wronged. We delved into occult texts and sought the advice of mediums, learning of rituals that could bind the entity once more. On the anniversary of our venture into Ashcliffe, we returned to the field, armed with our newfound knowledge. The ritual was complex, requiring each of us to relive a fragment of the asylum's collective memory, to acknowledge and accept the pain that permeated its existence. As the ritual reached its climax, a storm gathered overhead, the air charged with energy. Then, with a final, desperate plea, we sealed the entity away, the storm dissipating as quickly as it had formed. In the silence that followed, we knew it was over. The whispers had ceased, and the shadow that had loomed over our lives was gone. We were free, but changed, forever marked by our encounter with the forgotten souls of Ashcliffe. In the years since, I've often wondered about the nature of the places we deem haunted. Are they simply locations where the veil between worlds is thin, or are they reminders of our own capacity for cruelty and neglect? One thing is certain, the true horror of Ashcliffe was not the entity that dwelled within its walls, but the suffering endured by those trapped in its grasp. And while we may have silenced its whispers, the echoes of their pain will linger, a testament to the forgotten asylum and its lost souls. Story 6 I've always been drawn to the unexplained, the areas of the world where the map fades to legend. So when I heard about the Forest of the Missing, a dense, sprawling woodland where people disappeared without a trace, my curiosity was peak. It was a place shrouded in mystery, its stories a blend of folklore and chilling accounts from those who dared to venture near its borders. My fascination turned to obsession, and I found myself standing at the edge of the forest, camera in hand, determined to uncover its secrets. The forest greeted me with an eerie silence, a stark contrast to the bustling life I had left behind. The deeper I ventured, the more I felt a strange pull, guiding me off the beaten path. It was on one such detour that I stumbled upon an old camcorder, half buried under a layer of leaves. Its exterior was weathered, but to my surprise it still held power. Eagerly I played the last recording, and what I saw chilled me to the bone. The footage was from a hiker, much like myself, who had ventured into the forest years ago. The video showed a path not on any map, winding deeper into the heart of the forest, to a place where the air shimmered with an otherworldly glow. The hiker's narration was filled with excitement, a stark contrast to the growing sense of dread that settled over me. As the path led them to a clearing, the video revealed its most haunting secret, the missing. They were there, just as the stories had said, but they were wrong. Their movements were jerky, unnatural, 
as if they were puppets being controlled by unseen strings. The hiker's voice grew frantic, the realization dawning that this place was not a sanctuary, but a prison. The video ended abruptly, leaving me with more questions than answers. Driven by a need to understand, I followed the path shown in the footage, each step taking me further from the world I knew. The path was real, just as it had been in the video, and it led me to the same clearing. The missing were there, their eyes empty, their movements listless. They did not speak, but their presence spoke volumes. This was a place out of time, a limbo for those caught between worlds. I learned then that the forest did not simply take. It offered a trade the essence of life for the illusion of survival. Those who accepted found themselves trapped, unable to leave, their existence a mere echo of what it once was. Determined to escape the fate of the others, I retraced my steps, but the forest was not willing to release its grasp so easily. Paths twisted and turned, leading me in circles, the trees whispering secrets I could not understand. It was only by sheer luck, or perhaps the forest's own capricious will, that I found my way back to the world I knew. I emerged from the forest changed, carrying the weight of the truths I had uncovered. With the haunting images of the missing imprinted in my mind, I became obsessed with finding a way to break the cycle of disappearances. The footage I had found was a clue, but it was not enough. I needed to understand the forest's true nature, its origins, and perhaps find a way to sever its hold on those it had claimed. My research led me to ancient texts and interviews with the locals, whose ancestors had spoken of a pact with the forest, a sacrifice made to ensure the prosperity of the land surrounding it. The forest was not merely a collection of trees and paths, it was a sentient entity, hungry for the energy of life. Armed with this knowledge, I ventured back into the forest, this time with a plan. I would retrace the path I had taken, reach the clearing and perform a ritual that, according to the texts, would appease the forest's hunger and release the souls it had trapped. The forest seemed to sense my intent, the atmosphere charged with a palpable tension. The path was even more treacherous than before, the forest throwing obstacles in my way, as if it was testing my resolve. When I finally reached the clearing, the missing were there, just as before, their faces a tapestry of sorrow and longing. I began the ritual, reciting the ancient words and offering a piece of my own life force as a bargaining chip. The air around me shimmered, the ground trembling beneath my feet as the forest absorbed the energy. A silence fell, heavy and expectant, and then, a sigh, as if the forest itself was breathing a sigh of relief. One by one, the missing began to fade, their forms dissolving into the air, released from their imprisonment. The forest's grip loosened and for the first time I saw a glimmer of what lay beyond its boundaries a hint of another world, or perhaps a return to ours. As the last of the missing vanished I felt a shift, a lightness in the air. The path back was clear, and as I walked it I knew the forest was watching, its curiosity satisfied, its hunger abated for now. I emerged from the forest not as a conqueror but as a messenger, bearing the tales of those who had been lost and the knowledge that sometimes, the places we fear hold the keys to our salvation. The footage I found served as a testament to my journey, a warning to those who would dare to venture into the unknown, but it also stood as a beacon of hope, a reminder that even in the darkest of places there is light to be found if one is willing to seek it. The forest of the missing remains, a mysterious guardian of secrets and souls, but its story is no longer one of unending despair. It's a story of sacrifice, of understanding, and ultimately of release. Story 7 As I pieced together the grim tapestry of the Dollmaker's legacy, a plan began to form. I needed to free the spirits trapped within the dolls, to give them the peace they had been denied. Each doll was a meticulously crafted prison, 
holding the essence of a person who had vanished without a trace. I turned to the town's archives for any clue, any ritual or tradition that might break the enchantment. Buried in a dusty tome, I found a passage on ancient rites for releasing spirits bound to objects. The ritual required an item belonging to the person, a symbol of their essence, and a willingness to accept whatever consequences may follow. Night after night I performed the rituals, using belongings I found within the mansion that matched the historical records of the missing. With each ceremony a doll would crumble to dust, its spirit released, a faint whisper of thanks the only sign of its passing. But with each spirit freed, the atmosphere in the mansion grew heavier, as if the house itself was resisting my efforts. The remaining dolls became more animated, more desperate. They would rearrange themselves, creating scenes that depicted their lives and ultimately their disappearances. It was during these nocturnal wanderings that I stumbled upon the doll maker's personal diary hidden within the workshop. The pages were filled with ramblings about his quest for immortality, for a way to cheat death. He believed that by capturing the essences of the living within his dolls, he could siphon their life force, feeding his own existence. His experiments had twisted into something far darker than a mere hobby. The doll maker had discovered a way to trap the souls of the missing, binding them to the dolls as part of his grotesque collection. But his success was his undoing. The spirits, angry and confused, eventually drove him to madness his fate a mystery even to the town. Armed with this knowledge, I accelerated my efforts, determined to undo the doll maker's work. As the last of the dolls was freed, a storm erupted outside, as if the mansion itself was screaming in agony or anger. When the dawn broke, the mansion was silent once more. The workshop was empty, the shelves bare. The spirits of the missing had been released, their stories told through the rituals and the diary I found. In the weeks that followed, the atmosphere in the mansion lightened, the oppressive weight of its past lifted. I decided to stay, to turn the mansion into a memorial for those who had been lost, their stories preserved in the town's history. The doll maker's house, once a place of unspeakable horror, became a place of remembrance and healing. The spirits were gone, but their memory lived on a reminder of the past and a warning for the future. And sometimes, in the quiet of the evening, I swear I can hear the faint laughter of the freed spirits, a sign that they had found peace at last. Story 8 <clears throat> It was the kind of idea that only seems good when you're surrounded by friends, fueled by the adrenaline of youth and the thrill of a challenge. We stumbled upon the midnight game during a deep dive into the darker corners of the internet, a game that promised an encounter with the supernatural. The rules were simple, almost deceivingly so invite a spirit into your home and avoid it until 3.33 a.m. If you succeeded, you'd emerge unscathed. But the spirit, as the rumors went, often had different plans when the game concluded. Our group, a mix of skeptics and believers, decided to play one autumn evening. We followed the instructions meticulously, drawing a circle of salt, lighting a candle each, and knocking on the wooden door to our friend Mark's basement 22 times, the final knock as the clock struck midnight. We invited the spirit to join us, half in jest, not fully believing anything would happen. The game had begun. For the first hour, it felt like a glorified game of hide and seek, albeit with a chilling twist. We wandered the dimly lit basement, our paths illuminated only by the flickering candles in our hands, jumping at shadows and the occasional creaks of the old house settling. Laughter and taunts echoed through the rooms, a mask for the growing unease. As the night deepened, the atmosphere shifted. The air grew colder, thick with anticipation. It was then, as I navigated the narrow hallway near the storage room, that I first felt it a whisper of movement, a shadow that seemed to detach itself from the wall and glide across the floor. My candle flickered violently as if caught in a sudden draft and a chill wrapped around my spine. 
I told myself it was just my imagination, spurred by the game's premise, but a seed of fear had been planted. By 2 a.m., our bravado had diminished. Isolated incidents experienced by each of us began to weave together into a tapestry of terror. Jess claimed she heard her name whispered directly into her ear when no one was near. Alex's candle went out suddenly, plunging him into darkness until he managed to relight it, his hands shaking. We gathered in the main room, seeking solace in numbers, sharing our stories with wide eyes and hushed tones. The game, it seemed, was not just a game after all. The worst was yet to come. At exactly 3 a.m., the house plunged into darkness, every candle snuffed out in unison, leaving us blind in the consuming black. Panic set in, a visceral, primal fear as we scrambled to relight our candles, the only protection against whatever had joined us. The air was thick with the scent of sulfur, and the silence was oppressive, broken only by the sound of our frantic breaths and the distant, mocking ticking of the clock. It was during these moments of vulnerability that the spirit made its presence undeniably known. The temperature dropped so suddenly that our breaths became visible, misting in the frigid air. A low, guttural growl filled the room, sourceless and all-encompassing. We clung to each other, eyes wide, as the growl morphed into a cacophony of whispers, languages old and new entwining into a message we couldn't understand but felt in our very bones. The minutes dragged on, each second an eternity, until finally, the digital clock's display changed to 3.33 a.m. The oppressive atmosphere lifted as suddenly as it had descended, leaving us gasping in the silent, now seemingly benign room. We had survived, or so we thought. The spirit, however, had other ideas. In the days that followed, each of us experienced strange occurrences, Objects moved on their own, shadows flickered at the corners of our vision, and the feeling of being watched became a constant companion. The game had ended, but the spirit lingered a reminder of our folly. We sought help, desperate to rid ourselves of the entity we had so foolishly invited into our lives. Cleansings, salt lines, and every conceivable protective measure were employed, but the spirit remained, a malevolent force that revealed in our despair. The midnight game was more than a game, it was a lesson in respect for the unseen, a reminder that some doors once opened cannot be closed. We had sought a thrill but found a nightmare, one that clung to us, a shadow forever at our backs. As weeks turned into months, the initial terror faded into a dull, ever-present dread. Our group, once inseparable, frayed at the edges. The experience had bound us in a shared nightmare yet the weight of it pulled us apart. We were shadows of our former selves, jumping at the slightest sound, haunted by what we had experienced. I tried to move on, to bury the memories under layers of normalcy. I went to classes, laughed with friends who knew nothing of that night, and pretended the shadows didn't move in the corners of my eyes. But denial brought no solace. The spirit or whatever it was we had invited into our lives seemed amused by my attempts to ignore it. It became more brazen, manifesting physically now. I'd wake to find bruises in the shape of handprints on my arms or come home to find my belongings strewn across the floor, a silent testament to its presence. The breaking point came one evening when I was alone in my apartment. The air grew cold and the familiar scent of sulfur filled the room. I froze, a primal fear gripping me as I realized I wasn't alone. A shadow detached itself from the corner, growing in size until it loomed over me. I couldn't move, couldn't scream, my eyes locked with where I imagined its eyes would be. It spoke then, a voice like gravel, words that I couldn't understand but felt in my soul. It was a warning, a claim, a promise that it would never leave. Desperation led me to seek out others who had played and survived the midnight game. The internet was a wealth of hidden forums and chat rooms where people shared their stories, their warnings. I learned we weren't alone many had played, 
thinking it a game, only to find themselves ensnared in a nightmare without end. Some had found ways to cope, to protect themselves, but none had successfully banished the spirit. Armed with this knowledge, I reached out to my friends, the ones who had survived that night with me. We met, a reunion marked not by joy but by a shared resolve. We pooled our knowledge, our experiences and resources determined to find a way to end our nightmare. Our research led us to an old ritual, one that predated the game itself, a ritual of binding and banishment. It required elements we had invited the spirit with, but turned against it, a mirror to reflect its true form, salt to bind it, and it was stronger than the darkness we faced. It was dangerous, the texts warned, for if we failed, we would not only strengthen the entity but bind it to us for eternity. We had no other option. On a night when the moon was hidden, shrouded by clouds, we gathered once more in Mark's basement, the site of our folly. We drew the circle, lit the candles, and began the chant, our voices steady in the darkness. The air grew heavy, the shadows deepened, and a pressure built in the room, as if the world held its breath. The entity manifested, fury and malice given form, a melangetic mass of shadows and whispers. It raged against the circle, a tempest of darkness, but we held firm, our voices never faltering. The ritual reached its climax, and with a final, desperate plea, we directed the entity into the mirror, trapping it within. The silence that followed was deafening. We had done it, the spirit was bound, but at a cost. The mirror, now its prison, could never be broken, never be unguarded. We had saved ourselves, but in doing so, had taken on a responsibility that would span our lifetimes, a constant reminder of the night we played a game with the supernatural and barely survived. The midnight game was a lesson learned in the hardest way, a tale of curiosity and hubris, of darkness invited and barely overcome. We carry the scars, both seen and unseen, a testament to our encounter with the unknown. Story 9 The night air was crisp, filled with the static hum of anticipation that always came with the late shift. I've been a radio DJ for what feels like a lifetime, spinning tracks into the wee hours, providing a soundtrack for the insomniacs, the night owls, and those lost in their thoughts. It was a solitary job, but I found comfort in the anonymity, the connection with unseen listeners through the airwaves. The routine was always the same until one night, a call came through that broke the monotony. The voice on the other end was smooth, almost hypnotic, requesting a song with a dedication that felt oddly specific. For those about to take the longest journey, the caller said, a phrase that stuck with me long after the call ended. I played the song, thinking little of it at the time. But then it happened again. And again. Each request came shortly before news reports of missing persons hit the airwaves, their names eerily matching those mentioned in the dedications. A chill settled in my spine as I connected the dots, a feeling of dread that something far more sinister was at play than mere coincidence. Driven by a mix of curiosity and fear, I began to investigate the calls, tracing them back through the static, filled underbelly of the radio world to a frequency that shouldn't exist. It was an old band, long abandoned, crackling with the whispers of the past. Yet when I tuned in, what I found was not dead air but a broadcast that chilled me to the bone. The frequency was alive, in a sense broadcasting a series of numbers followed by names, each a prelude to disappearance. It was as if the broadcast itself was selecting its victims, dedicating their fate to the void before it happened. The realization that I had become an unwitting accomplice in this macabre ritual weighed heavily on me. Determined to uncover the truth, I delved deeper, my search leading me to the archives of the station, where dust-covered records spoke of a DJ who had vanished under mysterious circumstances decades ago. His last broadcast was on the very frequency I had uncovered, 
a project meant to explore the boundaries of radio's reach. Instead, it seemed he had opened a channel to something far more dark and inexplicable. The pieces of the puzzle slowly came together, revealing a history of disappearances linked to the broadcast, each victim connected through the dedications played on my show. It was as if the frequency had a will of its own, a sinister intelligence that used the radio waves to hunt. Fueled by a desperate need to end the cycle, I orchestrated a final broadcast, a message of closure intended to sever the connection. I chose a song, a dedication of my own to those lost to the frequency's call. As the song played, I felt the presence that had loomed over me since the first call receded, a pressure lifting from the air. But the victory, if it could be called that, was Pyrrhic. The frequency fell silent, but the shadows it cast lingered. In the aftermath, I left the station, my nights haunted by the memories of those dedications the voices that had reached out from the darkness. The last broadcast became a legend, a cautionary tale whispered among those who tread the line between the known and the unknowable. As for me, I learned the power of the unseen, the weight of words cast into the night, and the thin veil that separates us from the frequencies we dare not explore. In the silence that followed my departure from the radio station, I sought solace in the mundane, attempting to drown out the whispers that lingered at the edge of my consciousness. But the world had shifted on its axis, and I could no longer ignore the undercurrent of something unseen, a narrative that continued to unfold in the shadows. The mysterious frequency had gone quiet, but its echoes reverberated through the lives it had touched. Families of the missing sought answers, their pleas a constant reminder of the unresolved. I found myself drawn back into the fray, a detective of the airwaves, searching for clues in the static between stations. My investigation led me to others who had encountered the frequency, each with their own tales of strange broadcasts and unexplained phenomena. We formed a network, piecing together the fragments of a puzzle that spanned decades, tracing the origins of the broadcast to a time when radio was in its infancy a tool for connecting worlds both near and far. The more we uncovered, the more we realized that the frequency was not just a conduit for something sinister, but a keeper of secrets, an archive of stories untold. It was as if the broadcast itself was a living entity, feeding on the narratives it created, a collector of destinies. Determined to put an end to the cycle, we devised a plan to hijack the frequency, to broadcast a counter signal that would disrupt its hold. The operation was fraught with risk, the technology experimental. We were meddling with forces we barely understood, but the stakes were too high to ignore. The night of the broadcast was tense, the air charged with electricity as we tuned the equipment, aiming our signal at the heart of the mystery. As the counter frequency aired, a howl filled the room a sound that was not of this world, a cacophony of voices crying out in unison. Then, silence. In the days that followed, the frequency remained quiet, the chain of disappearances halted. It seemed we had succeeded, but the victory was bittersweet. The missing remained lost, their stories unfinished symphony symphonies, notes suspended in the ether. The experience changed me leaving scars invisible to the eye but etched deep in the soul. I returned to the world of radio, but the magic was gone, replaced by a reverence for the power of the unseen, the stories carried on the waves. The last broadcast remains a testament to the unknown, a reminder that some frequencies are better left unexplored. Yet in the quiet moments when the static fades and the airwaves hum with possibility, I find myself listening searching for the stories yet to be told, the secrets that lie just beyond the dial. Story 10 The day I stumbled upon the cryptic section of the old library marked the beginning of an unimaginable journey, tucked away in a neglected corner, where the dust of ages clung to air thick with the scent of decaying paper, a peculiar tome caught my eye. Its cover was plain, devoid of any title, 
yet it seemed to pulsate with a life of its own, beckoning me closer. Curiosity, that most human of traits, led me to open it. The pages, blank at first glance, began to fill with words as if an invisible hand were penning them in real time. These were not tales of past deeds or fantasies woven from the ether, but detailed accounts of future horrors, each more disturbing than the last. It was a book that wrote itself, predicting calamities with unnerving accuracy. Driven by a sense of duty, I attempted to warn others, to prevent the tragedies laid out on those ever-changing pages. My warnings, however, fell on deaf ears, dismissed as the ravings of someone who had spent too much time among the musty tomes. It was during these fruitless attempts to alter the course of the future that I encountered the librarian, a figure I had previously overlooked, assuming him to be as benign as the shelves he tended. Yet, as I delved deeper into the mystery of the self-writing book, I began to notice the peculiar interest he took in my endeavors. The more I observed, the clearer it became that the librarian was far from a mere custodian of knowledge. There was a darkness to him, a shadow that lurked behind polite smiles and courteous nods. He seemed to be everywhere, always a step ahead, his eyes gleaming with a mix of amusement and something more sinister. My suspicions grew as I witnessed events from the book unfold, each horror coming to pass despite my best efforts. It was as if the librarian was ensuring the book's grim predictions came true, manipulating events with the ease of a puppeteer pulling strings. The realization hit me like a physical blow the librarian was not safeguarding the book but using it, selecting its next story with meticulous care. And as I pieced together the clues, a cold dread settled in my heart. I was not just an observer or a would-be hero, I was the next story. The book had already begun to write my fate, a tale of paranoia and desperation as I sought to escape the librarian's influence. With every step I took, the narrative twisted, leading me down a path from which there seemed no return. In a final act of defiance, I confronted the librarian, demanding answers, seeking a way to break the cycle. His response was a tapestry of truths and lies, a revelation of his role as the cryptic librarian keeper of a book that was both a curse and a gift. He spoke of the library as a crossroads of reality and fiction, where the stories we tell shape the world around us. The confrontation ended not with violence, but with a choice. The librarian offered me a place by his side to become a custodian of the book, to wield its power with care. It was a temptation, a chance to use the book's predictions for good, to alter the course of the future. But some paths are too dark to tread, some stories too perilous to tell. I refuse, choosing instead to find another way, to seek out the book's origins and find a means to end its influence. The journey was long, fraught with challenges both mundane and otherworldly. I delved into ancient texts and sought the counsel of those versed in the arcane, each step leading me closer to the truth. In the end, the solution was as simple as it was drastic. The book's power was bound to the library, to the cryptic librarian who had become its master. To break the cycle, to free myself from the narrative that had ensnared me, the library had to be destroyed. The act was not without consequence. Knowledge was lost, history erased in the flames. But as the fire consumed the library, the book's words turned to ash, the predictions halted, their power dissipated into the night. I emerged from the ordeal changed, carrying the weight of my actions, the memories of the horrors foretold and averted. The cryptic librarian was no more, his schemes undone, but the shadows of the past lingered, a reminder of the cost of knowledge, the price of curiosity. The tale of the cryptic librarian and the self-writing book concludes here. But the echoes of the story remain, a cautionary whisper in the silence between words, a warning to those who seek to uncover the secrets that lie in the dark corners of the world. Story 11 Millfield, 
a name as mundane as the town appeared at first glance, with its quaint streets and the slow, rhythmic pace of life that seemed to echo a bygone era. Yet, beneath this veneer of normalcy, something ancient and malevolent stirred, casting long shadows where none should fall. It began subtly, the oddity of shadows moving contrary to the path of light, elongating and contorting in ways that defied explanation. At first, these occurrences were dismissed as tricks of the eye, mere figments of imagination spurred by the whisperings of superstitious old-timers. But as days bled into nights, the shadows grew bolder, their movements synchronized with an unseen, sinister rhythm. The first disappearance was that of old Mrs. Patterson, a widow who lived at the edge of town. Her absence went unnoticed until the whispers of her dark, whispering silhouette seen wandering the outskirts of Millfield reached a fevered pitch. Then came more, one by one, residents vanished, leaving behind nothing but shadows that seemed to whisper in a language forgotten by time. Drawn into the heart of this mystery, I scoured the town's archives, delving into the depths of Millfield's history in search of answers. What I uncovered was a tale so steeped in darkness, it seemed to bleed into the very fabric of the present. Millfield was built atop the ruins of an ancient settlement, one whose existence was erased by a cataclysmic event centuries ago. The settlers had meddled with forces beyond their understanding, invoking a curse that bound their spirits to the shadows, condemning them to wander the earth, whispering secrets to the living in a futile attempt to reclaim their lost lives. The shadows of Millfield, it seemed, were not mere absences of light but the remnants of these lost souls, twisted by time and the curse that held them captive. As I pieced together the puzzle, I realized that the disappearances were not random but a sinister pattern, each person taken replaced by a shadow, a whispering silhouette that sought to lure others into the darkness. Determined to break the cycle, I sought the counsel of the town's elders, custodians of secrets passed down through generations. They spoke of a ritual, one that could sever the connection between the shadows and the town, freeing the spirits and halting the cycle of disappearances. Armed with this knowledge, I prepared for the ritual gathering the necessary elements under the cover of night. The town square, once a place of communal joy, became the setting for a confrontation with the ancient curse. As the ritual commenced, the shadows converged, twisting and writhing in a display of defiance. The air crackled with energy, the whispers growing louder, a cacophony of voices from the past clamoring for release. With each word spoken, each symbol drawn, the bond that tied the shadows to Millfield weakened, their forms flickering, as if struggling to maintain their hold on the physical world. The climax of the ritual was a moment of pure chaos, the shadows lashing out, enveloping me in darkness. But as I uttered the final incantation, a burst of light shattered the night, the shadows dissolving into the ether, their whispers fading into silence. In the aftermath, the town of Millfield awoke to a new dawn, the shadows cast only by the light of the sun, their sinister movements a memory of the past. The disappeared returned, their memories of the time spent in the shadows fragmented, like a dream half remembered. The secret buried beneath the town's history was laid bare, a reminder of the cost of meddling with forces beyond our understanding. Yet, in breaking the curse, Millfield found a new beginning, the shadows of its past dispelled by the light of knowledge and courage. The tale of the shadows of Millfield concludes here, a story of darkness overcome by the resilience of the human spirit, a testament to the power of uncovering and facing the truths that lurk in the shadows. Story 12 The quaint facade of the Willow Inn belied the undercurrent of unease that permeated its walls particularly around room 313. This room, with its door perpetually closed and locked, held a mystery that had become the subject of whispered tales among the guests and staff alike. Adjacent rooms, despite the hotel's allure, were often left vacant, save for the occasional unwitting traveler. Nightmares, they reported, vivid and distressing, 
featuring a figure shrouded in despair, their cries echoing through the dreamscape into the waking world. My intrigue with Rune 313 began not with the intention to unearth its secrets but as a coincidence, a misplaced booking that led me to stay in Rune 312. The first night was restless, plagued by dreams of shadows and whispers, of sorrow so deep it felt as though it was drowning me. Each morning, I awoke feeling less rested, more drawn into the enigma of 313. Driven by a blend of curiosity and an unshakable feeling of being watched, I began to investigate. The hotel's records were curiously incomplete, with entries for room 313 abruptly ceasing several years prior. The staff, when pressed, offered nothing but evasive answers and hushed warnings, their eyes darting to the locked door as if it might open at any mention of its past. Undeterred, I sought out the town's archives, delving into newspaper clippings and public records in search of anything that might shed light on the room's history. It was there, amidst the yellowed pages of the past, that I uncovered the tragic tale of Room 313. Years ago, the room had been the scene of a heart-rending episode, a guest whose despair had led them to a final, irrevocable act. The details were sparse, shrouded in a deliberate silence by those who wished to forget. But the essence of the tragedy lingered, a stain on the fabric of the hotel. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the Willow Inn with a newfound determination to confront the haunting of Room 313. My inquiries, now focused and insistent, eventually led me to a retired housekeeper, a woman who had served at the hotel during the time of the incident. Her story filled in the gaps left by the archives, painting a picture of a soul tormented by loss and solitude, their despair magnified by the isolation of room 313. In their final moments, they had wished for their pain to be understood, to be shared so that they might not suffer alone. It was this wish, she believed, that bound their spirit to the room, their anguish manifesting as the nightmares experienced by adjacent guests. The realization that I had inadvertently uncovered the truth behind the room's past came with a heavy price. That night, the dreams intensified, the figure in despair no longer just a specter in my nightmares, but a presence that seemed to permeate the room, its sorrow a tangible force that threatened to engulf me. In my desperation, I sought to break the cycle of terror, to free both the spirit and myself from the grip of room 313. The solution, I believed, lay in acknowledging the pain and sharing the burden of sorrow that had been too much for one soul to bear. With a reluctant agreement of the hotel's management, I entered room 313, the air within heavy with a weight of unspoken grief. There, surrounded by the remnants of a life cut tragically short, I spoke aloud, offering words of understanding, of shared sorrow and of release. The night that followed was the longest of my life, a vigil marked by whispers and shadows, but as dawn broke, a sense of peace settled over room 313. The figure in despair, their presence so long a source of nightmares faded with the light, their departure a silent acknowledgement of the solace found in shared understanding. The haunting of room 313 ended not with exorcisms or rituals but with empathy a reminder of the power of human connection to transcend even the deepest of sorrows. The tale of Room 313, with its cycle of terror broken, serves as a testament to the unseen battles fought in the quiet corners of the world and the strength found in acknowledging the pain of another. Story 13 I had always been fascinated by the tales of the supernatural that my grandmother used to whisper to me under the cover of darkness, stories that danced on the edge of reality. One story, in particular, refused to leave the confines of my mind the legend of a vanishing village that appeared only during the rarest lunar eclipse, accessible through a hidden path deep within the woods near our town. It was said that this village was a slice of time a spectral reflection of a community long vanished, 
and that those who dared to enter during its ephemeral emergence were subjected to the curious curse of aging years in mere hours. Despite the ominous warnings, my curiosity was a wildfire that no amount of fear could douse. Decades later, armed with the skepticism of adulthood yet still captivated by the tales of my youth, I found myself drawn to the legend once again. The lunar eclipse was approaching, a celestial event that the elders claimed would unveil the hidden path to the village. It was a chance to witness the extraordinary, to prove the existence of the unexplainable. I assembled a team of like-minded explorers, individuals whose appetite for the unknown matched my own, and together we set out as twilight embraced the sky. The woods were dense, a labyrinth of shadows and whispers, but guided by the ancient maps in the light of the full moon, we found it a narrow, overgrown path concealed by the embrace of nature. The air here felt different, charged with a silent energy that raised the hairs on the back of our necks. We pressed on, the path unraveling before us like a thread leading into the heart of mystery. As we emerged from the embrace of the woods, the village appeared before us, bathed in the unearthly glow of the eclipse. It was as though we had stepped through a portal into another era. The houses, preserved in time, stood silent and watchful their windows dark eyes that seemed to follow our every move. The streets were empty, yet there was a palpable presence, as if the village was holding its breath, waiting. Compelled by an invisible force, we ventured deeper into the village. That's when we saw them the inhabitants. They were specters of a bygone age, going about their lives unseen until this moment of celestial alignment. They did not seem to notice us, these phantoms of the past, and yet their very existence challenged everything I knew to be true. It was then that the peculiar nature of our visit became apparent. Time here was a fickle thing, flowing differently, ensnaring us in its swift passage. Hours felt like minutes, and soon we noticed the terrifying toll it took on our bodies. My hands, once steady and unmarked by time, now bore the wrinkles and veins of accelerated age. Panic set in as we realized the curse was all too real. We were trapped in a temporal anomaly, victims of our own insatiable curiosity. The village, with its spectral inhabitants and timeless streets, was a prison from which there seemed no escape. Our desperation grew as we scrambled for a way out, the village seemingly closing in on us, its spectral residents oblivious to our plight. We retraced our steps, seeking the path by which we'd come, but the village was a maze, its layout defying logic and reason. The eclipse, our harbinger of hope, was nearing its end, and with it, our chance of escape seemed to dwindle. In our frantic search, we stumbled upon the village square, where the fabric of time appeared thinnest, and the air shimmered with a ghostly light. At its center stood an ancient sundial, its shadow cast by the eclipse's eerie glow. It was here, according to legend, that the boundary between the village and our world was weakest. With no other options, we formed a circle around the sundial, focusing our will on the desire to return home, to escape the temporal snare. As the last sliver of the moon's shadow passed, a blinding light enveloped us. Time seemed to fold upon itself, and for a moment we were suspended in a void where past, present, and future merged. Then, as suddenly as it had all begun, we found ourselves back at the edge of the woods, the path to the village gone, the night silent except for our labored breaths. We returned to our world, but not unscathed. The village had marked us, aging us prematurely, a permanent reminder of our brush with the unknown. But more than that, we carried with us the weight of a truth that few would believe that there are mysteries in this world that defy understanding places where time itself unravels. In the years that followed, our experience became a legend of its own, whispered among those who dare to believe in the unbelievable. The village vanished, its appearance as ephemeral as the eclipse that heralds its emergence. But I know that it waits, hidden away, a timeless sentinel for those brave or foolish enough to seek it.
And so my tale ends. A cautionary story of curiosity and the unfathomable mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of our understanding. Remember, some truths are better left undiscovered, for in the pursuit of the unknown, one may find themselves lost in time, forever a part of the vanishing village. Story 14 For as long as I could remember, my brush had been my confidant, my canvas the silent witness to the myriad of emotions that coursed through my veins. I was known far and wide as an artist who could capture the essence of a person's final moments, a gift or curse that I bore with a heavy heart. Each stroke was a whisper of the soul, each color a testament to the fleeting beauty of life's end. Yet I never imagined that one day, I would be commissioned to paint the most challenging subject of all myself. The commission came on an ordinary morning, wrapped in the guise of an unmarked envelope that lay innocently among the clutter of my studio. Inside was a simple, yet ominous request to self-portrait, capturing my essence as I had done for so many others. The irony was not lost on me, for how does one capture their own demise without succumbing to the fear of what lies beyond? With a sense of foreboding I began my work, setting my canvas against the backdrop of the early morning light. My reflection stared back at me from the mirror, a silent challenger in this macabre dance. As my brush touched the canvas, I felt an unfamiliar pull, a guiding force that moved my hand with an intention not entirely my own. The portrait that began to take shape was me, yet it held a somber quality, a shadow of something more profound and unsettling. Days turned into weeks, and with each session the portrait evolved, revealing not just the artist I was, but the man behind the brush. The colors grew darker, the lines sharper, and in the eyes that I painted, a haunting realization dawned upon me I was capturing my own demise. The portrait, once a blank canvas of possibilities, began to unveil the how and when of my end with terrifying clarity. The realization paralyzed me. I was caught in a web of my own making, a prisoner to the very talent that had defined my life. The knowledge of my impending fate was a weight too heavy to bear, and yet, I was compelled to continue to see this final masterpiece through to its bitter end. As the portrait neared completion, the world around me seemed to fade, leaving only the echo of my brush strokes against the canvas. The figure that emerged was a reflection of my soul, a chronicle of my life and the imminent end that awaited. The final touch was a date, etched into the corner of the canvas, a countdown to my last breath. But nothing prepared me for the commission that arrived on a crisp autumn morning, wrapped in the mystery of an unsigned note that requested a portrait unlike any other a self-portrait, capturing my own final moments. At first I laughed at the absurdity of it. How could one paint their demise without knowing when or how it would come to pass? Yet, as the days waned, curiosity gnawed at me. The idea became an obsession, a challenge that stirred the depths of my soul. I set up my canvas with a sense of foreboding, the blank expanse staring back at me like the unknown future. As my brush touched the canvas, a strange sensation took hold. It was as if my hand moved with a will of its own, guided by an unseen force. The portrait began to take shape, an image of myself not as I was but as I would be. Dark shadows formed around the figure, swirling with ominous intent, and I realized with a chilling clarity that I was painting my demise. Days turned into weeks as I worked on the portrait, each session revealing more of the grim future. My eyes in the painting held a haunted look, my surroundings morphed into a place I did not recognize a dark, deserted street lit by a single flickering lamppost. The most terrifying aspect was the shadow that loomed behind the painted version of myself, a harbinger of death, its form vague yet menacing. The more I painted, the more I felt the weight of impending doom. Sleep eluded me, nightmares of my own painted death waking me in a cold sweat. I became a prisoner of my own creation, driven to complete the portrait despite the terror it instilled in me. 
The realization of how and when my end would come hit me with the force of a thunderclap. The clues lay scattered throughout the painting the phase of the moon, the unique constellation of stars, the clock on the distant church tower striking midnight. It all pointed to one specific night, not far in the future. In a frenzy, I attempted to alter the painting, to change my fate. But the canvas resisted my efforts, each stroke to change the outcome only serving to make the prophesied end clearer. It was as if the portrait had a life of its own, dictating the terms of my existence. Story 15 yeah. The allure of the unknown depths had always called to me, whispering secrets of the deep that were waiting to be unveiled. As an experienced diver, I had explored the hidden corners of the ocean, but nothing could have prepared me for the discovery of the underwater cave system off the coast of a remote island, rumored to be the resting place of an ancient submerged town. Equipped with my gear and driven by a mix of excitement and trepidation, I descended into the azure abyss. The entrance to the cave system was an imposing sight, a maw of darkness that promised both wonder and peril. As I navigated through the labyrinthine tunnels, the only sounds were my own breathing and the gentle thrum of the ocean. It was then, in the midst of this silent world, that I heard at the distant, haunting sound of church bells. The sound was so clear so out of place in the watery depths that I paused, doubting my own senses. Yet, it persisted, a melodic call that seemed to beckon me further into the darkness. Driven by an irresistible curiosity, I followed the sound, swimming through the narrow passages that twisted and turned, leading me deeper into the heart of the cave system. The light from my flashlight danced across ancient rock formations, revealing glimpses of a world untouched by time. And then, suddenly the cave opened up into a vast, submerged canyon, and before me lay the remnants of what appeared to be a town, its buildings and streets eerily preserved beneath the waves. The sight was breathtaking, a glimpse into a pass swallowed by the sea. But it was the source of the bells that drew my gaze a towering church steeple, rising from the depths, its bell still intact swaying gently in the current as if tolling for an unseen congregation. As I approached the church, the sound of the bells grew louder, more insistent. It was then that I saw them the spirits of the drowned, their ethereal forms moving through the streets and buildings of the submerged town. They seemed to be caught in an eternal procession, a silent march that led to the open doors of the church. The spirits paid me no heed, their faces serene, as if they had accepted their watery fate. Yet their presence filled me with an overwhelming sadness, a sense of loss for the lives that had once thrived in this place. I felt an urge to join them, to become part of their eternal procession, a thought that chilled me to the bone. Resisting the siren call of the spirits, I reminded myself of the living world above, the mystery of the town and its spectral inhabitants was a puzzle that begged solving, but not at the cost of my life. With a heavy heart, I turned away from the church, intent on exploring the rest of the town, hoping to uncover the story of its demise. The further I explored, the more the town revealed. Homes stood silent, their interiors a snapshot of a day lost in time. A schoolhouse, its desks lined up in rows, books still open, a marketplace, stalls laden with goods now claimed by the sea. Everywhere, the echoes of lives interrupted. But it was in the town's archives, a building miraculously preserved, that I found the answers I sought. Sealed in a waterproof case, a diary survived, its pages telling the tale of a cataclysmic storm that sank the town, trapping its inhabitants beneath the waves. The church bells, it said, were rung one last time as a final farewell, a signal for those who could, to escape to higher ground. The spirits, then, were those unable to flee, their procession a never-ending loop of their last moments. The realization hit me with the force of a wave, a tragic loop of hope and despair. As I made my way back to the surface, 
The sound of the bells followed, a haunting reminder of the town and its lost souls. Emerging into the light of day, I took one last look back at the sea, the town's secrets now a burden I would carry with me. Back on land, I shared the story of the submerged town, its history, and its spirits. The tale was met with skepticism by some, awe by others. But for me, the experience was a stark reminder of the power of nature and the fragility of human life. The underwater bells still toll in my dreams, a call to remember the past and the spirits that linger in the depths. My dive into the unknown had revealed not just a lost town, but had connected me to the echoes of history, a link between the living and the drowned. And so my tale concludes a journey into the depths that uncovered a mystery long submerged. The spirits of the town, with their silent procession, taught me that some places, even in ruin, hold stories that reach beyond the confines of time and water. Story 16 Taking up the post as the keeper of the Montrose Point Lighthouse was a dream come true for me. Isolated on a craggy cliff overlooking the vast, unforgiving ocean, it promised solitude and a simple life, a stark contrast to the chaos of the city I'd left behind. The previous keeper, an old salt named Harold, had left rather abruptly, citing personal reasons, leaving behind only a set of logs and journals that chronicled the daily workings and occasional peculiarities of the lighthouse. It was during my first week, as I settled into the rhythm of my new life, that I stumbled upon a curious entry in Harold's logs. Every full moon, without fail, he wrote of a mysterious ship, a galleon that appeared on the horizon at dusk, its sails as black as the night. According to his notes, this apparition signaled a disaster somewhere in the world, a natural calamity, a great fire, a sudden coup. But what unsettled me the most was the last entry, dated just a week before my arrival. It read, the ship has set its course for Montrose Point. God help us all. Skeptical yet intrigued, I pored over the logs, trying to find any rational explanation for these entries. Perhaps it was isolation-induced madness, or maybe Harold fancied himself a writer of fiction. However, as the days passed and the full moon approached, an inexplicable sense of dread began to gnaw at me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. On the eve of the full moon, I positioned myself in the lantern room, binoculars in hand, my gaze fixed on the horizon. As the sun dipped below the ocean, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, the sea remained calm, too calm. Then, as the first sliver of the moon rose, I saw it a ship, a galleon, emerging from the mist, its sails as black as Harold had described. Panic set in as I remembered the last part of Harold's warning. The ship was coming from Montrose Point, but why? And what calamity did its arrival portend? I rushed to the logs, hoping to find something, anything, that might offer a clue on how to avert the impending disaster. Harold mentioned in his entries a series of rituals, old maritime superstitions that he believed could ward off bad omens. Desperate, I decided to follow his instructions. Gathering sea salt, a lantern from the lighthouse, and an old compass that had belonged to the first keeper of Montrose Point, I set out to the cliff's edge where the earth met the sea. I spread the salt in a circle around me, lit the lantern, and placed the compass in front of me, its needle quivering slightly as if disturbed by unseen forces. Then, I waited watching as the ship drew closer, its form becoming more defined in the moonlight. It was then that I noticed something truly peculiar the ship made no sound. No creaking of wood, no flapping of sails, nothing. It moved towards the lighthouse like a phantom, silent and foreboding. As it neared, I could see figures on the deck, shadows moving about, performing tasks unseen but undoubtedly part of the spectral crew. My heart raced and my mind screamed to flee, but I stood my ground, bound by an unspoken duty to protect Montrose Point and its secrets. The ship came to a halt just off the coast, close enough that I could see the details of its construction, the wear on its sails, 
and the eerie glow that seemed to emanate from within. It was then that the sea around me began to stir, the calm waters giving way to a churning maelstrom that threatened to pull me in. Fighting against the pull, I shouted into the night, declaring my intent to protect the lighthouse and all who sought its guidance. I recited the words Harold had scribbled in the margins of his log, a plea to the spirits of the sea for mercy and protection. The ship remained stationary, as if considering my words and then as suddenly as it had appeared, it began to fade, melting into the mist until nothing remained but the calm sea in the night sky. Exhausted, I collapsed, the lantern flickering out as I hit the ground. When I awoke, the sun was rising, casting its warm glow over Montrose Point, and the sea was peaceful once more. Reinvigorated by the morning's calm, I knew that the night's events, though surreal, were far from a mere dream. The logs, the ship, the rituals, they were all pieces of a puzzle that Montrose Point and its keepers were a part of. Determined to unravel the mystery, I dedicated myself to studying the logs in greater depth, alongside historical records of the area and maritime folklore. My research led me to tales of the doomed galleon, a ship cursed to sail the seas until it could deliver a warning to those who could avert tragedy. It was said that the ship's crew were souls who had perished in the calamities it foretold, bound to serve until the cycle of doom could be broken. I also discovered that Montrose Point was not chosen at random for the lighthouse. It was a place of significant spiritual energy, a beacon not just for ships, but for the supernatural. The rituals Harold had described were not superstitions, but ancient rites passed down through generations of keepers, guardians of the point's secret. As the months passed, I took up the mantle of guardian, marking the appearance of the doomed galleon with each full moon. Each time I performed the rituals, each time the ship would come closer before fading away, leaving behind an eerie calm. I began to understand that my role was not just to keep the lighthouse, but to act as a mediator between the natural and supernatural, ensuring the balance was maintained. The true test came one year after my arrival. As the full moon rose, the doomed galleon appeared again, but this time, it did not stop at the edge of the horizon. It sailed directly toward Montrose Point, faster than I had ever seen. I rushed to the cliff, performing the rituals with a fervor I had never known, but the ship continued its approach, unstoppable, inevitable. Then, it stopped, just as it had the first time, but much closer. From the deck, a figure stepped forward a captain whose visage was both terrifying and sorrowful. In his hand, he held a lantern, not unlike the one I used in the rituals, but it glowed with a spectral light. He spoke, his voice echoing against the cliffs, keeper of Montrose Point, you have shown courage and respect for the balance. The calamities are many, and while we cannot stop them all, we can offer warning. Heed our appearances for when the galleon sets its course directly for the lighthouse, a disaster of great magnitude is upon the world. Only through your actions can its impact be lessened. With that, the captain and his ship faded into the mist, leaving behind a solemn silence. I stood there, the weight of my duty heavier than ever, but with a newfound resolve to honor the legacy of the keepers before me and protect the world in the only way I could. From that day forward, I kept the logs with meticulous care, documenting not just the workings of the lighthouse but the appearances of the doomed galleon, a spectral warning in the night. I became more than a lighthouse keeper, I was a guardian of fate, a role I embraced with all my heart. Story 17 I had always been drawn to the unexplained, the mysteries that didn't quite fit within the realm of logic and reason. So, when rumors of a staircase in the middle of the forest began to circulate, accompanied by tales of missing persons and unexplained phenomena, I knew I had to investigate. The staircase, according to local lore, was an anomaly, an architectural fragment devoid of context or purpose, standing alone amidst the dense canopy of trees. 
It was said that those who dared to climb its steps experienced distortions in time, visions of events yet to come, or in some cases never returned. Me armed with my notebook, a camera, and a healthy dose of skepticism, I set out to find this staircase. The forest was vast, a sprawling expanse of ancient trees and untamed wilderness that seemed untouched by time. After hours of trekking, I stumbled upon a clearing, and there it stood a weathered staircase, its stone steps moss-covered and worn, leading to nowhere. Surrounding the base were dozens of missing persons posters, faded and aged, each telling a story of someone who had ventured into these woods and never returned. The air was thick with an inexplicable tension, a silent warning to turn back. But curiosity drove me forward. I approached the staircase, each step deliberate, my heart pounding in my chest. I reached out, touching the cold stone, half expecting it to vanish at my touch. But it was solid, real. Taking a deep breath, I began to ascend, counting the steps as I went. One, two, three. As I climbed, a sense of disorientation began to wash over me. The forest around me seemed to blur, the sounds of nature fading into a hushed silence. I pressed on, determined to reach the top, but with each step the staircase seemed to extend, the top always just out of reach. Then, without warning, the world shifted. I found myself standing at the top of the staircase. The forest stretched out below me, bathed in the golden light of sunset. But something was wrong. The air was heavy, charged with an energy I couldn't explain. I took out my camera, snapping a picture of the view. When I noticed something in the periphery, a figure standing at the edge of the clearing, watching me. I called out, but received no response. As I descended the stairs, the figure remained motionless, a sentinel observing my every move. Reaching the bottom, I approached cautiously, only to find that it wasn't a person at all, but another missing person's poster, this one much newer than the others. The face on the poster was familiar too familiar. It was mine. Panic set in as I scanned the surrounding forest for any sign of escape. But the more I searched, the more I realized that the landscape had changed. Paths that once led back to civilization now twisted into dense, impenetrable thickets. It was as if the forest itself was reshaping, trapping me within its grasp resolved to delve deeper into the mystery. I refused to succumb to the fear that clawed at my sanity. The realization that I was potentially facing the same fate as those before me only fueled my determination to uncover the truth. I retraced my steps to the staircase, convinced it was the key to escaping the forest's inexplicable hold. Night began to fall, casting long shadows across the clearing. The staircase, now more ominous in the dim light, seemed to beckon. I recalled the tales of lost time and unexplainable phenomena, wondering if the staircase acted as a portal, a gateway between realities, or if it was merely a catalyst for the forest's inherent power. With no other options, I decided to ascend the stairs again, but this time with a focus on breaking the cycle. I remembered reading about rituals and symbols used in various cultures to ward off evil or alter one's fate. Drawing a circle around the staircase with stones and branches, I invoked any protective energies that might be listening. As I climbed, I concentrated on my desire to return to my known world, to break free from whatever enchantment held the forest. The air grew colder with each step, and the silence was suffocating. Reaching the top once more, I found the forest bathed in an ethereal light, neither day nor night. Then I saw it a path that hadn't been there before, illuminated by a soft, glowing light that seemed to cut through the fabric of the forest's enchantment. With no hesitation, I descended the staircase and followed the path, which meandered through the trees with purpose. The further I walked, the more the oppressive energy of the forest began to wane, replaced by a sense of peace. Eventually, the path led me to the edge of the forest, where the familiar sights and sounds of the outside world greeted me. I had escaped, 
but not without a deep understanding that the staircase and the forest were guardians of a threshold, keepers of a balance between our world and something much older, much stranger. I returned to civilization with my story, but without proof, it was met with skepticism. The camera I had used atop the staircase was gone, lost to the forest or perhaps never meant to capture what lay beyond our understanding. My experience became another tale, another warning about the staircase in the woods. As for me, I can't shake the feeling that I left something behind, a piece of myself on those steps. Sometimes I dream of the staircase, its top bathed in that otherworldly light, calling me back. And I know, deep down, that the mystery of the staircase in the woods is far from solved, that others will find it, drawn by their own curiosity or fate. But I also know the price of that curiosity, the weight of the unknown that rests on the shoulders of those who seek out the places where the world's thin and something else peeks through. I've learned to respect the boundaries of our reality, to heed the warnings of those who came before, and to remember that some mysteries are not meant to be unraveled. Story 18 There's a place that exists outside the boundaries of maps, a diner that only reveals itself to those wandering not just physically lost, but lost within their lives. I stumbled upon the eternal diner on a night filled with despair, my life's choices leading me down a path of regret and longing for what could have been. The diner appeared as if conjured by my deepest yearnings, its neon sign flickering in the darkness, promising a sanctuary for the soul. Inside, it was timeless, a slice of Americana untouched by the outside world. The waitress, a woman with eyes that seemed to hold centuries of secrets, handed me a menu. The last meal you'll ever need, she said, her voice a melody of promise and warning. Each item on the menu was an embodiment of a life's desire, success, love, revenge, peace. With a heavy heart, I ordered a meal that promised to rectify my deepest regret lost love. The food was indescribably delicious, each bite a memory, a what if, a glimpse into what could have been. As I took my last bite, the world around me began to blur and I found myself transported to an alternate reality. Here, my lost love and I had never parted ways we lived the life I had always dreamed of. But this reality was tainted, twisted in subtle, macabre ways. My love was possessive, our life together a gilded cage. Happiness was interwoven with threads of darkness, each desire fulfilled with a cruel twist. The more I explored this new world, the more I realized the cost of dining at the Eternal Diner. Every wish granted carried with it a shadow, a perversion of the original desire. I sought a way back, a return to my own reality, but the diner was nowhere to be found. It seemed as though I was trapped in this alternate reality, a prisoner of my own wishes. In my search for a way back, I encountered others who had dined at the Eternal Diner, each living their twisted desires. We shared our stories, our warnings, and our regrets, forming a bond over our shared plight. Together, we began to understand that the diner did not just offer solutions to life's problems, but served as a lesson on the nature of desire and the importance of facing life's challenges head-on, rather than seeking magical solutions. Determined to escape the twisted reality crafted by the Eternal Diner, we embarked on a quest to uncover the diner's origins, believing it to be the key to finding our way back. Our journey led us through realities that bordered on the surreal, each more disturbing than the last, as if the very fabric of these worlds was woven from human desires gone awry. In one reality, success was measured not by personal achievement, but by the ability to diminish others. In another, love was an obsession that consumed all reason. Yet, in each world, whispers of the eternal diner persisted, a beacon for the hopelessly lost, always just out of reach. Our breakthrough came when we discovered a common thread in our stories, a moment of profound despair preceding our visits to the diner. It was this despair that opened the door to the eternal diner, and we theorized that a moment of genuine acceptance of our original lives, with all their flaws and unfulfilled desires, 
might reveal the path back. Together we confronted our regrets, acknowledging them not as failures but as integral parts of our lives. This act of acceptance was our most challenging meal yet, a feast of humility and understanding that required us to digest the bitter truths of our existence. As we each reached a place of genuine contentment with our original lives, the eternal diner reappeared, its neon sign a beacon in the darkness, but this time it held no allure. We entered not as patrons desperate for an escape, but as travelers seeking passage back to our realities. The waitress greeted us with a knowing smile, as if she had anticipated our return from the start. The diner serves those who wish to escape, she explained, but true escape comes not from running from your problems, but from facing them. With her words echoing in our minds, we left the eternal diner, each step away from it solidifying our return to our original realities. The transition was seamless, a gentle awakening from a dream, leaving us back in our lives but changed. The diner's lesson was clear life's problems cannot be solved by escaping into fantasies. True resolution requires courage, acceptance, and the willingness to confront our deepest fears and desires. As for the eternal diner, it remains waiting in the shadows for the next lost soul. But for those of us who have dying there and returned, it serves as a reminder of the complexity of desire and the importance of embracing the life we have, with all its imperfections. Story 19 My life changed the day I found the ancient tomb buried in the archives of a forgotten library. Its pages filled with tales of a curse, as old as time itself, the curse of the blackened heart. It was said to afflict those consumed by hatred and resentment, turning their hearts into blackened stones and condemning them to a life of torment and isolation, yet granting them unnaturally long life. My interest was personal, my own heart had begun to harden, the result of a betrayal that had left my soul scarred. Driven by a mix of fear and desperation, I embarked on a quest to find a cure, tracing the curse through history. My journey led me to the stories of those who had suffered under the curse, each account a mosaic of pain, betrayal, and a burning desire for redemption. The first was a knight from the medieval ages who sought vengeance against his brother for usurping his birthright. His heart blackened over years of bitter conflict, leaving him in a mortal shadow, wandering the ruins of his former life. From him I learned the weight of carrying hatred through centuries. Then there was a woman from the 18th century, scorned by her lover and cast aside for another. Her heart turned black as she plotted her revenge, a plan that left her isolated in a world that moved on without her. Her story taught me the poison of dwelling on past wrongs, each story, each era, revealed a pattern the curse was not just a punishment but a reflection of the darkness within, a mirror to the depths of human resentment. Yet, within these tales I also found threads of hope, whispers of redemption for those who could overcome the darkness of their hearts. As I delved deeper into the curse's lore, I discovered ancient rituals and arcane knowledge lost to time, suggesting a way to reverse the curse. But the path was fraught with danger, requiring the afflicted to confront their darkest emotions and forgive those who had wronged them, a feat easier said than done. My search brought me to a remote village, shrouded in mist and secrets, rumored to be the resting place of a sage who had once broken the curse. It was here, in the heart of the village, that I came face to face with my own darkness, my own blackened heart. Embarking deeper into the essence of redemption and confrontation with one's darker self, the narrative unfolds further, exploring the delicate balance between forgiveness and the scars of past wounds. In the village, I encountered the descendants of the sage, guardians of the knowledge to break the curse of the blackened heart. They revealed that the key to lifting the curse lay not in spells or potions, but in the challenging act of true forgiveness and understanding the root of one's own bitterness. To break the curse, I was to undertake a ritual that would confront me with the embodiment of my resentment. 
On the night of the full moon, I stood at the edge of a sacred pool, its waters reflecting the starlit sky, a mirror to the soul. As I gazed into its depths, the water began to swirl, forming images of my betrayer, reviving the pain and anger I had harbored for so long. The ritual required me to dive into the pool, to physically confront my resentment in a realm where emotions manifested as tangible entities. The cold water enveloped me, and I found myself in a dark void, face to face with a shadowy figure that mirrored my deepest fears and hatred. The battle was not physical but emotional, a struggle to let go of the pain that had defined me. With each attempt to strike the figure, I only found myself weakened, realizing that the fight was feeding the curse, not defeating it. It was only when I dropped my defenses, acknowledging the hurt and accepting the past, that the figure began to dissolve, along with the darkness that had clutched my heart. Emerging from the pool, I felt a weight lift from my soul. My heart, once heavy with the curse, now beat with a lighter rhythm, freed from the chains of resentment. The path to healing was not immediate forgiveness as a journey, not a moment. But for the first time in what felt like an eternity, I saw a future where my heart was whole, not blackened by the past. The stories of those afflicted by the curse, once a warning, became a lesson a testament to the power of the human heart to overcome darkness with light, hatred with love. My own story added another chapter to the time I had discovered, a beacon of hope for those who might find themselves lost in the shadow of their own hearts. As I left the village, the sage's descendants reminded me that the curse is as old as humanity itself, a reflection of our capacity for both darkness and light. The curse of the blackened heart persists, not as a mere affliction, but as a reminder of our ongoing struggle against the parts of ourselves that we fear and despise, and the continuous need for compassion, both for others and ourselves. Story 20 It They Imbeshovi The day the signal was detected marked the dawn of a new era in human history. Originating from the depths of space, it was an anomaly that defied all known laws of physics and astronomy as steady, repeating sequence that suggested an intelligent origin. I was part of the team at the International Space Observatory tasked with analyzing the signal, a blend of scientists, linguists, and cryptographers, all united by a common goal to decipher the message from the stars. As weeks turned into months, the signal became an obsession. It was unlike anything we had ever encountered, a complex series of pulses and patterns that eluded all attempts at decryption. But it was the dreams that truly unsettled us. Members of our team, myself included, began experiencing vivid, shared dreams of otherworldly landscapes and apocalyptic visions, all connected by a sense of impending cataclysm. These dreams, we soon realized, were not mere figments of our imagination but seemed to be linked to the signal itself. It was as if the message was not just reaching our instruments but our minds, weaving its way into our consciousness. Driven by a sense of urgency, we delved deeper into the signal, using every tool and theory at our disposal. It was during this frenetic search for answers that we made a breakthrough. The signal, we discovered, was not just a message but a warning, foretelling a cosmic event that threatened not just our planet but the very fabric of space-time. The dreams, it seemed, were a manifestation of this warning, a shared premonition of what was to come if we failed to act. The message spoke of a convergence, a moment when the barriers between dimensions would weaken, allowing a cataclysmic energy to seep into our universe. With the clock ticking, we raced to develop a plan to avert the disaster. It required a feat of science and engineering unlike any before, a way to harness the signal itself to reinforce the fabric of space-time. The world came together as never before, pooling resources, knowledge, and technology in a unified effort to confront the challenge head-on. As the day of the convergence approached, the dreams intensified, a nightly journey into a world on the brink. But amid the visions of destruction, there were also glimpses of hope, 
of a future saved by the courage and ingenuity of humanity. In the final hours before the convergence, the atmosphere was electric, charged with a mix of fear, anticipation, and hope. Our plan, dubbed Operation Starshield, was ambitious a network of satellites equipped with technology designed to amplify the signal, creating a protective barrier around the planet. As the satellites took their positions, a sense of unity enveloped the world. People from every corner of the globe watched, waited, and hoped, their differences momentarily forgotten in the face of a common threat. The moment of convergence arrived with a silence that was almost deafening. The stars seemed to hold their breath and then, with a burst of light that spanned the horizon, it began. The energy from the signal, now magnified a thousandfold, wove an intricate lattice of light across the sky, a shield that shimmered with colors unseen by human eyes. The cataclysm, when it came, was a storm of energy that defied description, a maelstrom of cosmic forces that collided with the shield in a spectacle of light and sound. For a moment it seemed as though it would not hold, that the fabric of our reality would tear under the strain. But then, as quickly as it had begun, the storm abated, the energy dissipating harmlessly into the void. In the aftermath, the world was changed. The dream ceased, leaving behind a collective memory of what had been and what might have been. The signal, too, fell silent, its purpose fulfilled. We had averted the disaster foretold by the stars, but more than that, we had proven to ourselves and to the universe that when faced with the unknown, humanity could stand united. The signal from beyond became a symbol of hope, a reminder of the potential for greatness within each of us when we transcend our differences to confront the challenges of the cosmos together. As for me, I returned to my work with a new sense of purpose, forever changed by the knowledge that we are not alone in the universe, that across the vast expanse of space, there are others reaching out, seeking to connect, to warn, and perhaps to guide. Story 21. Bike. My first night on the job as a security guard at the Montrose Historical Museum was supposed to be straightforward. The museum, housed in an ancient building with a storied past, was rumored to be haunted, but I was a skeptic. Ghost stories were for tourists, I thought, not for someone who had spent years in the security business but nothing in my experience had prepared me for the enigma of the museum's oldest exhibit a centuries-old mummy named Anka Fan. As part of my rounds, I passed by Anka Fan's sarcophagus, a magnificent piece adorned with intricate hieroglyphics, supposedly cursing any who disturbed his eternal slumber. I chuckled to myself, dismissing the curse as nothing more than a clever gimmick to attract visitors. However, when I glanced at the CCTV monitor, I froze. Ankafen's position had changed. What was once a peaceful repose now seemed like a silent snarl, his hand positions altered to something almost dot 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 inviting. Convincing myself it was a trick of the light or a lapse in my attention, I continued my patrol, only to find every pass by Ankafen's exhibit heightened my unease. The air grew colder, the shadows deeper, and the silence was punctuated by the subtle, inexplicable sounds of ancient whispers. With each shift, the museum's atmosphere thickened with an anticipation of something sinister lurking just beyond the veil of reality. Ankafen's exhibit became a focal point of my dread, his sarcophagus seeming to pulse with a malevolent energy. It was on my third night. As I reviewed the security footage to assuage my doubts, that I saw it an imperceptible shift in Ankafen's sarcophagus, as if responding to my scrutiny. Driven by a mix of fear and fascination, I delved into the museum's archives, seeking answers about Ankafen. The mummy, an advisor to pharaohs, had been buried with a dark secret or ritual that promised eternal life at a sinister cost. Legend had it that Ankafin had sought to transcend death, not through the preservation of his body, but through the absorption of life force from the living. My skepticism waned as the evidence mounted. Employees who had worked night shifts reported unexplained illnesses, 
and some even vanished without a trace, their last known location near Ankafen's exhibit. I realized I was not just a security guard, I was a guardian against an ancient evil that sought to breach its confines. As the next full moon approached, rumored to be the peak of Ankafen's power, I prepared to confront the curse head on. The museum became a battleground between the living and the undying, with Ankafen's sarcophagus at its heart. Armed with my resolve and a hastily assembled array of protective charms and ancient incantations gleaned from the museum's archives, I faced the coming night with a mixture of dread and determination. The museum's silent halls, once benign under the light of day, now seemed to whisper with the echoes of a time long past, each shadow a cloak for unseen watchers. The full moon cast a spectral glow through the skylights, bathing Ankafen's sarcophagus in an eerie light. It was then that the air shifted, a palpable change in the atmosphere, as if the boundary between the living and the dead had thinned to a mere veil. I stationed myself before the sarcophagus, the ancient text spread out before me, my voice steady as I recited the incantations meant to bind Ankafen's spirit. The sarcophagus began to tremble, a low rumble that grew in intensity until it filled the room with a sound like thunder. Then, silence. In that silence, a voice, ancient and weary, spoke. Ankafen's spirit appeared before me, not as the malevolent force I had expected, but as a man, bound to the earthly realm by his quest for immortality. His eternal life was not a blessing but a curse, one that brought endless isolation and regret. Ankafen revealed the true nature of his curse. It was not meant to grant eternal life, but to serve as a warning against the hubris of defying death. His spirit could only find rest if his tale served as a lesson to the living, a reminder of the natural order of life and death. With newfound understanding, I worked through the night, crafting a new exhibit around Ankafen's sarcophagus, one that told his true story. I included the tales of the night watchmen, the guardians who stood watch over the secrets of the past, ensuring they were remembered not as mere curiosities but as lessons for the future. As dawn broke, I felt a lightness in the air, a sense of peace that had been absent since my first night. Ankafen's spirit had found rest, his curse lifted not by magic, but by understanding and empathy. The my nights at the museum became quieter, the whispers and shadows fading into memory. But I never forgot the lessons of Ankafen, the night watchman's dilemma that turned into a journey of discovery, uncovering the depths of human folly and the power of redemption. Story 22 Abartel I boarded the cross-country train with a sense of relief, eager to leave behind the hustle of the city for a while. The rhythmic clacking of the tracks and the gentle sway had always calmed my restless mind. I found my seat by the window, a perfect spot for watching the world blur by. The train, a marvel of modern engineering, promised a smooth journey across diverse landscapes, from bustling cities to serene countrysides. Not long after settling in, I noticed someone taking the seat across from me. He was a man of indistinct age, with a kind of timeless air about him. Dressed in clothes that seemed to belong to another era, he carried himself with an easy grace. He caught me staring and offered a warm smile, introducing himself as Julian. Julian was a storyteller, a wanderer with a treasure trove of tales from every corner of the globe. He spoke of ancient cities swallowed by the desert sands, of hidden temples in dense jungles, and of nights spent under the stars in vast, uncharted territories. His stories were imbued with a sense of wonder and a deep knowledge of the world that was both captivating and enviable. As the hours passed, Julian shared more about his life, his travels, and the people he'd met along the way. There was something about him that made you want to listen, to learn, and to understand the world through his eyes. Yet for all the stories he shared, he remained a mystery, revealing little about himself beyond his travels. Curiosity got the better of me one evening, and I asked one of the train attendants if they knew where Julian was headed. The attendant looked puzzled, 
scanning the passenger manifest before shaking his head. There's no one by that name listed on this journey, he said, a frown creasing his brow. I was taken aback. How could that be? Julian had been my companion for days, sharing meals and stories with equal generosity. Yet, according to the train's official records, he didn't exist. I returned to my seat, questions swirling in my mind, but Julian was nowhere to be seen. That night, as I lay awake in my berth, Julian reappeared. His usual warmth was replaced by a solemnity I hadn't seen before. Listen closely, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Not all journeys are measured by the distance traveled. Some are about the paths we choose and the legacies we leave behind. Beware the crossroads ahead, not all who wander are lost, but some are never meant to be found. With that cryptic warning, he vanished. I blinked, half expecting him to reappear, but he was gone. The next morning I searched the train, asking passengers and crew alike, but no one had seen Julian or even recognized his description. The remainder of the journey felt surreal, Julian's absence like a void that the passing scenery couldn't fill. His warning echoed in my mind, a puzzle missing too many pieces to solve. I found myself poring over maps and train schedules, trying to decipher any hidden meaning in Julian's final words. But the more I searched for answers, the more questions arose. The train rolled into its final destination, and as I stepped off, the reality of the situation hit me. Julian, with his stories and warnings, had disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. I couldn't shake the feeling that our meeting wasn't mere coincidence but a crossroads in my own life's journey. Determined to uncover the truth, I began retracing our route, visiting the places Julian had spoken of with such passion. Each destination brought me closer to understanding the enigma that was Julian. I learned of a traveler from decades ago, a man whose life mirrored Julian's tales. This traveler had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only stories and speculation. As the pieces of the puzzle started to fit together, I realized Julian's warning wasn't about physical crossroads but about choices and consequences. He wasn't cautioning me against a specific danger but urging me to consider the impact of my decisions, to live a life filled with purpose, and to leave behind a legacy of kindness and exploration. Months turned into years and Julian's presence in my life faded from a haunting mystery to a guiding spirit. I traveled not just for the sake of moving from one place to another, but to understand the world and my place within it. Julian had ignited a spark within me, a desire to see the unseen and to know the unknowable. One evening, as I watched the sunset from a remote mountain peak, I realized the truth of Julian's existence. He wasn't just a person, he was the embodiment of wanderlust a reminder that the journey is as important as the destination. Julian lived on in the stories he had shared, a traveler not bound by time or space but by the endless pursuit of discovery. As I descended the mountain, I felt a sense of peace. Julian's warning had become my mantra, guiding me through the crossroads of life. I understand now that some are meant to wander, not to be lost, but to find themselves in the vastness of the world. And so my journey continues, a testament to the mysterious passenger not on the manifest who changed the course of my life. Julian's legacy wasn't in the places he'd been or the stories he'd told, but in the lives he'd touched, including mine. Story 23. It was just past midnight when my phone rang, slicing through the silence of my dimly lit living room where I sat reading. The number flashing on the screen was one I didn't recognize, but curiosity got the better of me, and I answered. Hello, my voice echoed slightly, a hint of apprehension threading through. Please, you have to help me. The voice on the other end was frantic, barely above a whisper, as if scared of being overheard. It was a woman's voice, laced with terror and desperation. Who is this? What's wrong? I asked, 
my concern growing with each passing second. But before she could reply, the line went dead. I stared at the phone, the abrupt silence feeling heavier than the darkness around me. I tried calling back, but it went straight to voicemail. The message was generic, giving nothing away about the owner of the phone. Over the next few days, the calls continued, each one more unsettling. The voice pleaded for help, providing me with locations to meet, but every time I arrived, there was nothing but empty, abandoned places. An old warehouse on the outskirts of town, a desolate pier during the dead of night, a rundown motel with flickering neon lights, each location felt like a scene from a horror movie, leaving me with more questions than answers. The calls started affecting me deeply, seeping into my thoughts during the day and haunting my dreams at night. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of being followed. Shadows seemed to linger longer, and every creak and whisper of my house made my heart race. Determined to get to the bottom of it, I enlisted the help of a friend who worked in telecommunications. We traced the calls, but every lead took us to another dead-end disconnected numbers unregistered SIM cards, and even a phone booth in a town that had been abandoned for decades. As the calls became more frequent, the voice began revealing details about my past that no stranger could possibly know. Childhood fears, long-forgotten memories, even the chilling story of how my old dog disappeared one summer night all spoken back to me with eerie accuracy. I felt myself spiraling, caught in a web of paranoia and fear. My reality blurred with nightmares, each call eroding the barrier between them. I was living on the edge of sanity, jumping at shadows and doubting every face I saw. One evening, as I sat pondering my next move, the phone rang again. This time, the voice was different, calmer, almost familiar. It guided me to an old house on the edge of town, promising answers and an end to the torment. I arrived as the last light of day faded, the house looming like a specter in the twilight. The door creaked open as I approached, a cold breeze inviting me inside. The air was thick with the scent of dust and old memories, each step forward a descent into the unknown. As I reached the heart of the house, the room lit up with the flicker of candles, revealing a table set with two chairs. In one sat a figure shrouded in darkness. My heart stopped as the figure leaned into the light, revealing a face I hadn't seen in years my own sister, who had vanished without a trace when we were just children. The revelation hit me like a tidal wave, memories flooding back in a torrent of emotion. She spoke of a life spent in the shadows, of being taken that fateful night, and of a desperate search to find her way back to me. The calls, the locations, they were all breadcrumbs, a trail designed to lead me to her. As we spoke, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, the years of pain and searching culminating in this single, surreal moment. Our reunion was bittersweet, a mixture of joy and the deep scars of time lost. The night grew old as we shared stories, filling the gaps that the years had created. As dawn approached, we knew that the road ahead would be long and fraught with challenges but for the first time in a long time, I felt a glimmer of hope. The unending phone call had finally reached its conclusion, not with the terror I had anticipated, but with a reunion that mended a broken past. As the sun rose, casting light on the shadows that had plagued me, I realized that sometimes, the most terrifying journeys lead us back to where we belong. With the morning light washing over us, casting long shadows across the old wooden floor, my sister and I stepped outside, leaving the haunted confines of the house behind. The air was fresh, a stark contrast to the heavy atmosphere we had endured through the night. As we walked, she told me of her life after that night she was taken, a tale filled with twists and turns that seemed almost too bizarre to be true. She spoke of a shadowy organization that had orchestrated her disappearance, one that delved into the supernatural and the occult. It was a world hidden in plain sight, manipulating events and people from the shadows. She had been caught in their web, a pawn in their games, until she managed to escape, 
The phone calls, the cryptic messages, they were all part of her plan to expose them and reunite with me, her only remaining family. The realization that such darkness existed so close to the surface of our everyday lives was chilling. Yet, here we were, walking together, survivors of a nightmare that had tried to consume us both. Our conversation turned to our parents, the years of grief and uncertainty they had endured, and the countless unanswered questions that had haunted them since her disappearance. Determined to bring closure to our family, we decided to confront the organization and bring them to light. It was a daunting task, one that would require all the strength and courage we could muster. We spent days planning, gathering evidence, and reaching out to contacts my sister had made during her years in hiding. The confrontation was inevitable, a clash between the light of our determination and the darkness of their deeds. It happened on a stormy night, the kind that felt like a harbinger of change. With the help of a few trusted allies, we infiltrated their stronghold, a place where the air was thick with secrets and danger lurked around every corner. The battle was fierce, a chaotic symphony of wills clashing in the dark. But in the end, we emerged victorious, the organization's leaders captured and their operations exposed to the world. The aftermath was a whirlwind of media attention and police investigations, but through it all, our family stood strong, united by the ordeal we had overcome. The day we re-reunited with our parents was one of overwhelming emotion. Tears, laughter, and stories filled the air, healing the wounds that had been open for far too long. My sister's return was a miracle, a beacon of hope in a world that often seemed devoid of it. As life slowly returned to normal, or as normal as it could be after such an experience, I often found myself reflecting on the journey. The unending phone call had led me down a path I never expected, through darkness and into the light. It taught me about the strength of the human spirit, the bond of family, and the power of hope. In the end, the unending phone call was not just a connection between two siblings lost in the shadows, it was a call to action, a reminder that even in the face of overwhelming darkness, there is always a path back to the light. And sometimes, the most terrifying experiences lead us to the most profound discoveries about ourselves and the world around us. Story 24 It all began the day I stumbled upon an antique shop nestled between the modern facades of the bustling city street. The shop was a relic of the past, its windows dusty, yet displaying an array of items that whispered tales of yesteryears. Among the cluttered collection of bygone treasures, a painting caught my eye. It was a portrait of a young woman, her gaze hauntingly serene, as if she harbored a secret known only to her. The beauty of the painting was undeniable, and without a second thought, I purchased it, feeling an inexplicable connection to the woman depicted. I hung the painting in my living room, above the fireplace, where the light of the setting sun would dance upon the canvas, bringing the woman's features to life. For weeks, it was a source of fascination for my guests and myself, a beautiful mystery captured in oil and canvas. However, as days turned to weeks, I began to notice subtle changes in the painting. At first, it was the faintest of lines creasing the woman's once smooth forehead. Then, her vibrant eyes seemed to dim, shadows deepening beneath them as if she were growing weary with each passing day. The changes were gradual, almost imperceptible at first, but as time went on, the transformation became undeniable. The painting was aging. With a growing sense of unease, I observed as the woman in the painting grew older, her beauty decaying into a visage of sorrow and despair. The once vivid colors of the canvas dulled, mirroring the decay that consumed the woman's form. It was then that I realized the changes in the painting were not just confined to the canvas. My life, too, had begun to mirror the unsettling decay portrayed in the painting. Misfortune started to befall me, each event seemingly connected to the deteriorating state of the portrait. A flourishing relationship ended in heartbreak, my career faced unexpected setbacks, and a constant feeling of being watched settled over me, 
suffocating my once carefree spirit. The painting had become a harbinger of doom, its changes predicting the unraveling of my life. Determined to uncover the truth behind the painting and its eerie influence, I delved into its history. My search led me to the descendants of the artist, an obscure painter whose name had been lost to time. They spoke of a curse, a tale passed down through generations, about a young woman who had been wronged, her spirit trapped within the painting as a vessel for her vengeance. The curse was meant to bring ruin to any who possessed the painting, binding their fate to hers until the cycle of suffering could be broken. Realizing the gravity of my situation, I sought ways to sever the connection, to free both the woman's spirit and myself from the curse that entwined our destinies. It was a journey that took me to the edge of reason, exploring ancient rituals and seeking the counsel of those versed in the supernatural. The culmination of my efforts led to a night of reckoning, under the light of a blood moon, when the veil between the worlds was at its thinnest. With the painting before me, I performed the ritual, a desperate plea to release the tormented soul from her painted prison. As the ritual reached its peak, the painting convulsed with an unearthly energy, the canvas writhing as if alive. Then, in a burst of light, the image of the woman began to revert, her features renewing, the colors brightening until she once again resembled the young woman I had first been captivated by. As the light faded, so did the painting, until all that remained was a blank canvas. In the days that followed, the shadow that had loomed over my life began to lift. Fortunes improved and the feeling of being watched dissipated, leaving me with a sense of peace I had not felt since the painting entered my life. The painting that aged had been more than a curse, it was a lesson in the interconnectedness of fate and the power of redemption. Though the canvas now lay empty, the experience had left an indelible mark on my soul, a reminder of the mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of our understanding. With the curse lifted and the painting now a blank canvas, life gradually returned to normalcy. However, the profound impact of the events had irreversibly changed my outlook on the world around me. The empty canvas became a symbol of a new beginning, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of redemption. It hung in my living room, no longer a source of fear, but a reminder of the ordeal I had overcome. In the aftermath, I became fascinated with the supernatural, delving into studies and literature that I would have previously dismissed as mere fantasy. My experience had opened my eyes to the mysteries that lay hidden in the shadows of our reality, waiting to be uncovered. As months passed, I became a beacon for those who had experienced similar phenomena, sharing my story and offering support to those who found themselves entangled in the inexplicable. My home, once a place of solitude, became a meeting ground for discussions on the paranormal, a haven for those seeking understanding in a world that often refused to believe. But the true closure came one evening, as I sat by the fireplace, the blank canvas above it catching the flicker of the flames. A knock at the door broke the silence of the night, a sound that now carried a sense of anticipation rather than dread. Standing at my doorstep was a woman, her eyes reflecting a wisdom that seemed to stretch beyond her years. She introduced herself as a descendant of the young woman in the painting, the final piece of the puzzle in a story that had spanned generations. She spoke of her ancestor's life, a tale of love, betrayal, and a curse born from the depths of despair. Her visit was not just a search for answers, but a quest for peace for both her family's legacy and the soul of the woman who had been trapped within the painting. Together, we sat and shared our stories, finding solace in the understanding that the past, no matter how dark, could be reconciled. It was a night of healing, of bonds formed across the chasm of time, anchored by the shared experience of the painting that aged. As she left, the woman turned to me, a smile gracing her lips. Thank you, she said, for setting her free. Her words were a balm to my soul, a final affirmation that the journey I had embarked upon, fraught with fear and uncertainty, had led to a resolution not just for me, 
but for all those touched by the painting's curse. The painting that aged had been a conduit for a story much larger than myself, a narrative woven through time, connecting the lives of strangers bound by fate. It taught me that behind every object, every artifact, lies a story waiting to be told, a history that holds the power to transform lives. In the end, the empty canvas remained, a silent guardian of the secrets it had once held, but the legacy of the painting lived on, a reminder of the unseen forces that shape our destinies and the enduring power of hope in the face of the unknown.